I would like to thank Orna for this opportunity to address the symposium, participate in the symposium. I'm, I'm truly honored to be invited to uh, participate with these distinguished, very distinguished uh, speakers. And I, I would like to thank uh, Professor Lloyd for the book, because you brought me back to things that I'd studied as an undergraduate. Um, I had the honor of taking a course with Brent Berlin, and uh, he got quite angry at a question that I asked as an 18-year-old undergraduate about the functionality of color terms. He didn't like the question. Um, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to formalize ideas which I've been cogitating on for the last 25 years since I began to teach stone tools. Ideas which normally would just come out over uh, an arak in a pub with the students. And this is an opportunity to um, try to think about them in somewhat more formal terms. Uh, we've been addressing culture very much through linguistic, through, through language. Culture as language, culture as ideas and concepts, which we structure through language. And I want to offer an alternative perspective. I don't want to dispute culture as language. I just want to offer something else, a different way of looking at it. And um, there will be those, I don't think any of my colleagues are here, but there will be those who will say that I'm anti-language because I'm linguistically challenged. And my students will agree, uh, my students who I teach in Hebrew, uh, my abilities to massacre the holy tongue. Stone tools are a, a really good means of measuring the origins and development, dare I use the word evolution, of culture. They're the only element of culture that goes back to our origins as humans, however you define that. We have stone tools that go back to two and a half million years ago. And we have stone tools that continue through the human career up until now. Okay? There are still societies that use stone tools. And for, most of, for any of you who still smoke, you're still using stone tools because you're lighter is made of flint. It has a little piece of flint, and that's how you're setting your fire in your lighter. And that was how people made fire well into the 19th century, and before matches became totally available. So stone tools offer us a record, a developmental record, of culture over the course of two and a half million years, roughly. And I just want to give you here the scale of time that I'm talking about, okay? So we're talking about more than two million years ago, and of course that's East Africa, up through recent times. I've put down the origins of fire, which is around one million, and cave art, which is around 40 or 30,000 years ago. And these are the examples of the stone tools that I'm actually going to use as uh, examples of the, again, development of human cognition through material culture. Material culture in this, play, in this particular situation being stone tools. I've put together four variables which I want to look at for looking at the development of human cognition of culture over the course of these four million years. And one is the ability to shape. Here I've called it, no, here you see no imposed symmetry. The ability to shape an artifact. That's really a kind of, what are you seeing? What are you actually doing? What are you aiming for? What's the conception? The complexity of the artifact. How many times do you have to actually hit it? We're talking about stone tools. We're talking about chipping stone tools, napping flint. How long does it take to do it? What's the investment? The third. Um, Third variable actually is complexity. How many different kinds of activities do we need to actually create the tool? So we can do one activity, we can do chipping repeatedly, but it's really one activity, it's, it's the reiteration of the same thing. When do we have to change that activity to get to another stage in production? And the fourth, uh, my fourth criterion or variable here 
is when do we put things together? When do things become more than the one piece? When do we use different technologies and different raw materials to get composite tools? So here you see in the early stages, the lower Paleolithic and the older one culture, we have very, very simple stone tools. They're called choppers. We get them in uh, East Africa. We get them at Ubedia. We get them in the Negev. Uh, the first wave of people out of Africa brought these. We have them now in uh, Georgia. And that's apparently about as far as we're going to get them before they develop into other things. That first wave, that first development of material culture in East Africa, and that first wave of people out of Africa. The second stage, or they're really divided into two stages, is our first sense of any kind of symmetry. So you see on this side, uh, I, my right and left here get confused. Your left, uh, we see the very beginnings of symmetry. And on your right, artifacts which actually have a template or a paradigm associated with them. So already, a million years ago, we're getting an aesthetic. We're getting a template construction in Homo erectus, or something related to Homo erectus, which is a major change. Now, it took a million years to get there. But it's a, it's a pretty significant, significant conceptual change over that first chopper. Okay. Th this is already a level of abstraction. And I'm not going to review the different stages. You, you can see the variables here that, that I've, I've uh, indicated. But we have greater symmetry and shape control, greater number of blows, uh, three stages of modification. It's much more complex instead of merely two. And you can see this one only has two stages of modification. I'm not going to try to explain the terminology. I asked my, one of my friends to review this PowerPoint and the paper that accompanies it, which I'm not reading to you. Um, and he said, nobody in the audience will know what decortication is. And after this talk, you still won't know what it is. But you can look it up. Um, and finishing. So basically, initial work, by the time we get to those very beautiful hand axes on your right, we have initial removal of the external skin of the flint. We have a rough out. And then we have fine finishing. Okay? So we have three stages, three separate, distinct or discrete technologies, sub-technologies types of work that are done, which is very different from the two earlier stages. We're still only dealing with handheld tools. Okay? By the way, functionally, these things are kind of like Swiss Army knives. They were used as knives. They were used as chopping tools. They were used as, as um, pounders. They were used as, for a whole range of different functions. By the time we get to the Middle Paleolithic, translating that, Neanderthals, early Homo sapiens, not quite us yet. We have very complex tool manufacture. Again, I don't want to go into the details of this, but we can define easily, easily, four discrete and separate stages in the actual production of the stone tools, sometimes five. Okay? Furthermore, we're now getting hafting, very clear taking of two separate materials. That piece on your right is actually a spearhead. And we have very good evidence that those were hafted to spears. This is the first time we have that. A piece of flint and a piece of wood. Two different things put together. That's also a leap in abstraction, a leap in conception. By the way, just for the record, that's a reconstruction that a student made. Okay, That's not original. And by the time we get to the upper Paleolithic, modern people, it turns out that in terms of, this surprised me, I have to admit, in terms of these parameters that I've established, I don't see a difference. The levels of complexity, the levels of investment, the, uh, the um, type of uh, hafting, I don't see a difference. Now, we all know Neanderthals didn't have art. And modern people created the cave art. So we know there's a conceptual change. But 
think this argues for the legitimacy of what I tried to do. I, I actually didn't pick up this change in the stone tools. Okay, we can pick it up a little bit later. But in terms of the cognition, in terms of how people did things, how people conceived of making their material culture, how they saw their material culture, how it functioned, um, we see very similar things between Neanderthals and modern humans. And by the way, I have to say, archaic humans use the exact same, sorry, archaic homo sapiens, okay, the people from whom we are the direct descendants, share the exact same material culture as Neanderthals. Neanderthals are a European dead end. Uh, so, but they were roughly at the same cognitive level as those early us. Okay? Um, so what do we see with the rise of Homo sapiens? If I can't see differences, clear differences, in complexity in the stone tool assemblages, in stone tool technologies, what do we see? And here is, I think, where we come back to some of the points that Professor Lloyd has made. Um, sorry, I'm gonna move. This, this ties into the previous uh, um, slide. What we see is much increased rapidity of change. We see now constant change. Now remember, the difference, the population density differences between these earliest stages of people and the preceding stages are not great. We're still talking about band level hunter gatherers. We're not talking about large population groups. We're not talking about elaborate connections between them. Okay? We're still talking about very, very low densities of population. So the change in rapidity of change cannot be explained as a function of population increase. We all know now in, in modern society that density of population uh, directly affects innovation. It would be very, very hard to argue that 40,000 years ago or 30,000 years ago. What we're seeing is a cognitive change. People are changing rapidly. They're able to innovate more rapidly and they're adopting these changes. They're more open to the changes. That's a significant change. So that's one point we have in much increased human cultural diversity, which is a function of being human, it turns out. Okay. That aspect of the, the very fact of diversity is what makes us human. When I look at the stone tools, we can argue about everything else later. This is my case study on the stone tools. And this is, these are just arrowheads. And what you see here, when arrowheads are introduced about 15,000 years ago, so, and the chipped stone arrowheads disappear about five, about 6,000 years ago. So we have less than 10,000 years of chipped stone tools. And every few, every few hundred years, every two or three hundred years, we get a major change. Now this is, this is schematic. There are sub-changes as well. Every few hundred years, there's a total change in how people viewed their arrowheads. Okay, let's, let's go on. The other thing, in addition, to change over time is that we have geographic variability which didn't exist in the preceding periods. When I look at that middle paleolithic expanse and I restrict myself to, well, let, let, let me not restrict myself, to where we have not, let's, let's take out East Asia because we don't have materials. So from, say, Iran, west and south into Africa, where we have the Middle Paleolithic well documented, it all looks the same. I can take a spear point from Israel and take it into South Africa and you couldn't tell the difference. And they'll be roughly contemporary. I can take a scraper from northern, from, uh, well, not northern Europe, it's covered by glaciers, but from Italy or from France, I can bring it to Kessem Cave, which my colleagues here at Tel Aviv University are excavating, and I couldn't tell the difference. 
And yet when I move into the period of Homo sapiens sapiens, I can take, these are all axes. They're all, you can all identify them clearly as axes for chopping trees and for woodworking. And you can see intense variability between different regions. So, summing this up, what we have really is just a good quote, you know, we're in Israel, we should quote Genesis. Um, what makes us human, if I'm looking for something to bridge this culture, nature divide, it's not some, there's no line. In fact, what's ma what, makes, what seems to make us a little bit different is, is that we're diverse and that we innovate rapidly as human, as homo sapiens sapiens. I will leave it at that. Thank you.